Good morning and welcome to worship at Our Savior's Lutheran Church on this, the 15th Sunday of Pentecost. I'm so glad that you can join us for worship today. A couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, every year we do the Ludafisk Supper and we've been doing it for over 70 years now. It has been a huge deal. And while things are a bit different, obviously everything is different, we want to continue that tradition. And so hopefully you have seen in the, in the insert and in emails uh, that we have gone to a takeout menu for Ludafisk Supper this year. Uh, please take a look at that. Um, that is on the website. We'll have a little area where you can make purchases for the different um, a la carte items. Um, it's a pretty exciting new way that we can do this. Um, so please take a look at that. And keep an eye out for, for ways that you can serve uh, for that, for the Ludafisk Supper, uh, even in this changed environment and what that looks like. Um, we're very excited about that new step that we can take. Also upcoming this week on this Wednesday, September 16th, uh, confirmation will be beginning. And so if you have a confirmation aged kid, uh, then you need to keep an eye out for an email. An email will be sent out to all of the parents uh, clarifying all of what's going on this year. Um, and just so you know, uh, group A, which will be, you'll see in the email, will be the ones who are going to meet this week. Group B will meet next week. Please make sure to check your email and see which group your child is in. That way they don't come to the wrong night. We're trying to keep the numbers down, help the school with their, uh, with their handling, uh, and just, you know, Safety precautions. We're trying to trying to keep that in mind. Also, this Sunday, uh, we are lifting up a family in the church who has given the church twenty years of service, uh, serving in different capacities, but especially as our uh, as our custodians and as leading the the fair stand. The Chisholms um, have been a huge uh, impact, had a huge impact on this church and its ministry. And so please take some time this week uh, to uh, spare a thought for them, uh, to, to send them a note, give them a call, post on their Facebook page, uh, a thank you for all of the dedicated work that they have given to the church. Um, and as they step into the next phase of their life, uh, the, the kinds of things that God is calling them to next, uh, because uh, a lot of exciting things are happening for the Chisholm. So we want to thank them for their service uh, for the continued dedication to the church and for everything that God has done through them and will continue to do through them. All the other announcements can be found in the bulletin, which you can find at the website, OurSaviorsChurch.info. So please pop by there, get your bulletin. You can follow along with the worship service there and see the rest of the announcements. With that, let us prepare our hearts and minds as we begin with the confession and forgiveness. In this place, we remember, God is the one who delivers us. God is the one who gives us what we need. God is the one who shows us the way. God is the one who brings us home. And here we gather, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merciful God, we come to you in need of your forgiveness. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, we have lost our way in the midst of all the uncertainty. When we lost sight of you, we put our trust in what we could see, or what money could buy, or what worked for someone else. We have chosen our own desires over our neighbor's needs. We have believed the lie that there is not enough for everyone, so we need to look out for ourselves. We have failed to trust that you are still with us. We want to trust in you again. We want to be near to you once more. Forgive us, Lord. We need you to restore us. People of God, God hears your cries and gives you everything that you need. In this very moment, God hears your desire for forgiveness and answers your prayer. In the name of our everlasting God, your sins are forgiven and you are delivered. Thanks be to God. Let us continue with our gathering hymn.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Leading God, you carried your people to the edge of the sea and made a way where there was no way. Teach us to trust in you that we will step into your promised future that leads through the waters and on to the promised land. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we'll hear from the scriptures. First, I'd like to invite the children for, for the children's time. Well, good morning, kids. I'm glad that you could join me for worship today, and I get a chance to talk to y'all about uh, one of our readings today. Today, I want to talk to you about the gospel, because it's a really important lesson that we learn. Today's gospel is all about forgiveness, and we've heard, we hear that word a lot, forgiveness. And maybe, maybe, it's important for us to know, what does that mean? What does forgiveness mean? Well, sometimes we, we come to the understanding that forgiveness means pretending like someone didn't do the bad thing that they did, you know, erasing the slate, pretending like it didn't happen. And that can be kind of hard, you know, because what if, what if somebody like breaks your toy, like breaks it and it's not working anymore? Do you, can you pretend like they didn't do the thing that they did? I mean, that's really, really hard to do. Well, what if instead of pretending like you, like they didn't do the thing that they did, forgiveness meant something else? What if it meant instead giving somebody the chance to make it right, you know? Because if somebody breaks your toy, like breaks it beyond repair, you're not really going to want to hang out with that person, are you? You're probably going to be pretty mad at them. Well, what if they're really, really sorry for what they did and they really want to make it right? Well, what forgiveness means is letting them do that. It's, it's saying, okay, I know you did a wrong thing. I know you did a bad thing, but I'm going to let you try to make it right. And I'm going to believe that you're going to try to make it right. That's what forgiveness is all about. Because sometimes people do really, really bad things. And sometimes they're bad things that, that, that they really, they should never have done. But it doesn't mean that God is telling us that we have to pretend like they didn't do the terrible thing that they did. What God is telling us is we should always be open to letting people try to make it right. Now, obviously, they can't make it perfectly right, but forgiveness means we're open to letting them try because in the end, we do the best that we can. We do the best that we can for each other, and if we trust that the other person is really going to try to do the right thing, they're going to they're gonna try to, they're going to not break your toys anymore, for example then, then you, can, you can move forward. You can trust that you can still play with them because they've promised not to do that again. And they're going to live up to their word. And so that's what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is about letting people try to make things right and believe that they're really going to do that. Okay? So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for giving us the chance to make things right. Help us to forgive others so they can make things right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks kids, and I'll see you next week. Good morning. The first reading is from Exodus 14, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel, and so the cloud was there with darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, 
the waters forming a wall for them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the, and went into the sea after them, all of the pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they returned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and their chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall. And they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than the other, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we die or whether we live, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported it to their lord, all that had taken place. Then his lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave, 
as I had mercy on you. And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will do also to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. After wave after wave of plagues, rivers turned to blood, frogs everywhere, fire from the sky, darkness at noon, and even the death of the firstborn. Pharaoh had finally relented and let Moses take the Israelites out of Egypt. There must have been a feeling of wonder among the Israelites, realizing for the first time in hundreds of years they were finally a free people. The cruelty of slavery was done for, and they were on their way to the promised land. Moses must have seemed like quite a hero to them as they walked together, belongings in tow, down the coast road toward Canaan. Then, for some reason, they veered off the road. The pillar of fire and cloud that had been leading them on the way suddenly led them down into the wilderness, where they camped by the shore of the sea. And then, dust appeared on the horizon. A cloud rising from the edge of their vision that could only be from the hoofs of horses, the whirling spokes of chariots, and the stamping feet of soldiers. Pharaoh, ever the dithering, indecisive tyrant, had gone back on his word to free them and decided not to let them go and he had sent his army to retrieve them. Imagine the panic in the camp. Imagine knowing that you have just tasted the fresh air of freedom for mere days when your captors have caught up with you, and you are pinned between their approaching army and the sea. There is no way out. This is the end. You and everyone you know is either going to die at the hands of Pharaoh's soldiers, drown trying to escape into the sea, or be taken prisoner and forced back into the slavery you had just so recently escaped. But just then, the pillar of cloud and fire suddenly leapt to block Pharaoh's army, coming between the camp and the horde. It blocked any movement of the chariots and soldiers. They could do nothing but stare malevolently as a sudden east wind kicked up and the impossible started to happen. The sea, that cold, dark place that was going to be the watery grave for panicked Israelites, suddenly started to be pushed back. Its waters piled up on either side as a causeway emerged. Then Moses issued a command to go. Go through the sea, through the causeway, to the other side. And the whole congregation of Israel escaped through the sea. And then the pillar finally relented and let Pharaoh's army chase Israel into the sea. And then the wind died. And the water came crashing down. God saved the people of Israel, putting an end to any threat Pharaoh and his army may have had over them anymore. God makes a way where there is no way. This story gives us a dramatic reminder of that. We, when we find ourselves pinned between the army of Pharaoh and an unforgiving sea, God opens a causeway to lead us to freedom. God did this, and it's no wonder that it's such a powerful reminder for us of God's faithfulness and protection. 
But I want to back up for a minute and focus on those moments before the sea was parted. See, when the Israelites saw the dust cloud of Pharaoh's army appear on the horizon, they didn't quietly wait for Moses to tell them that all would be fine. And they didn't think that there would be some miracle, despite having seen God's mighty acts in Egypt. In fact, they didn't so much as ask God to save them. Instead, do you know how they reacted? They turned to their leader, Moses, and asked him, dryly perhaps, was it because there were not enough graves in Egypt that you led us out here to die in the desert? Yeah. Because looking at it, they were right. They had been led to an impossible position where they were stuck. Pharaoh had the most powerful army in the history of the world so far. What exactly was a ragtag assembly of Israelites supposed to do to stop them? And the sea. The sea blocked their path entirely. There was no going there. Sure, some of them might be able to swim to the other side, but that would be few and far between. This was the end as far as anyone could tell. And that anxiety rippled over the whole congregation. In a way, I think we may feel something like that. Pinned against the shore, unable to go back, but terrified of what lies ahead. We have anxiety and grief about how we can't do things as a church the way that we've always known how to do them. Whether that's worshiping inside this sanctuary, or doing the Ludicrous Supper with tables and outfits and music, or gathering all together every week for confirmation, or every Sunday for Sunday school. We look at all that we want to do, all we could go back to, and we know we can't go there. But how do we go forward? We look ahead, and all we see is open water, an unknown future that we don't even know how to navigate, let alone survive. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to be the church if we can't do what we've always done? I know it's not in the text. But there is a Jewish tradition called Midrash, where they take the stories of the Bible and embellish them a little to help see the text a little differently. I have this Midrash in my head, uh, the moments before the sea split, when the Israelites are worried about how long the pillar of fire and cloud will keep Pharaoh's army at bay. And Moses commands the people. Moses commands the people then to start walking into the water. The sea hasn't been split yet in this midrash. I imagine their fear and confusion. But one of them starts to do it. And then another. And another. They take steps into the water. Waves lapping up by their ankles. Then their knees. Then their hips and their chest. Fathers put children on their shoulders. Grandparents hold their children's hands. And slowly the congregation starts to venture into the sea. And it's only then, after they've started, that Moses raises his staff. And the east wind blasts the water. And the sea is split. Suddenly, those who were anxiously in the water up to their necks, hoping that Moses knew what he was doing, find themselves on dry ground, and they make it to the other side. But they had to step into the water first. Siblings in Christ, we are being asked to step into the water. We are being asked to do the very thing that every fiber of our being 
says that we cannot do. We are being summoned to have the faith to trust that God is at work even now in the midst of a pandemic when we can't meet in the sanctuary for worship and we can't gather for the loot of this supper and we can't do all the things that we have always associated with church and trust that God is not going to let the church drown. God is not going to let the church drown when we can't get, meet together in the sanctuary because God is present wherever you are. God is not going to let the church drown when our young people have to learn about their faith, whether in confirmation or Sunday school, in a totally new way because God is the one who carries us through and sets the fires of hope in our souls and deepens our faith. God is not going to let the church drown when the fair is canceled and the Ludifus Supper goes to pickup service and baptisms happen outside and Bible studies happen in a home and not in the blue chair room because God and God alone is the one who has called this church together, not us, not us or our traditions or our will, but God alone who has called us. So step into the water, my beloved congregation. Step into the water and trust that God is going to save us from this pandemic too. God is going to hold our faith together in this hard time. God is going to inspire us to deepen our trust in Jesus at home and at work and in the public sphere because the church has left the building. So get together in small groups at your homes to study the Bible or pray through the directory together or sew quilts or write notes of encouragement to others. Set aside time every day to explore with your children and grandchildren the faith that holds us together. What is Jesus calling us to do today? Call a school the food pantry, the weapons shelter, the hospital, and ask them what help the people of God can offer to help them weather this pandemic. Step into the water. Do the scary thing. Be the church. And just do wait, my beloved congregation, my dear sisters and brothers, my siblings in Christ, because God just like in the days of Moses, is going to send an east wind. God is going to send an east wind that will split the sea before us and show us that glorious vision of the promised land where the church is truly the body of Christ in the world, where faith leads us to do wonders, where forgiveness and reconciliation make the world whole and reign supreme, where hope does not end, where life conquers death, where love binds us together, humanizes all people, and breaks down the dividing wall between every one of us. The beloved community awaits. The beloved community stands in the promised land on the other side of the waters. The beloved community waits for us, and it all starts with stepping into the waters of the unknown and trusting that God is going to guide us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Together with the whole people of God, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in, com in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Grant us hope as we do new things in Sunday school, confirmation, and Bible studies to learn about your saving work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. When you split the sea, you show your mastery over creation. Tame storms and floods, droughts and fires, and teach us to steward your mighty creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. We pray especially for Phil, Della, Judy, Mark, Norris, Mason, Bob, Larry, Tom, Tom, Gary, Anna, Betty, Alan, Zachary, Kristen, and all those we name now before you, whether out loud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness, for the knees that taught us how to bow to you, and the tongues that taught us to praise you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you all. At this time, we lift up our, our offerings to God as we hear an offering of music.
And now let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now as you go forth to step into the waters that God has called you into, and trust that God will split the sea before you, take this blessing with you. May the peace of Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into God's doors. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us sing together our sending hymn. And now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.